And welcome back to Blunt Business here on CannabisRio.com. We're really thankful and grateful for all of you to go and join us once again. And as you know, in the program the last few months, as we've been going, going through now, the last several months we've been focusing on the some very core topics when it comes to 2024, specifically the HHS recommendation to deschedule cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 at a DEA's impending decision to go and do that along with all the things that came from that, the rollouts of cannabis licensing or I mean, for cannabis programs, you know, the ongoing issues in New York, the startup in Ohio, and you know, among other, and Minnesota as well, among other things. And of course, it's nice to have somebody on board that can go ahead and really speak on all subjects as such and, and really is pretty frequently noted to be writing about it, speaking about it, and getting a chance to be asked about these various issues. So you know him very well. Well, well just as a recursive refreshing, he is a known cannabis industry dealmaker, largely responsible for the creation and growth of the CBD industry due to the legal strategies, litigation matters, and policy efforts he has developed for his firm's clients. He chairs the first U.S.-based law firm to expand its cannabis industry services across the globe with attorneys in the EU, EU European Union, Latin America, and beyond. So joining me right now, Welcome back to the program, a chair of the cannabis practice at Clark Hill, Robert Hoban. Robert, thanks for being back on. It's really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hope you're doing well today, and Happy New Year, man. It's been a while. I know it has been, and so much has also changed. One of the things I didn't even talk about yet, which I should mention because of the fact that you now, you've been servicing the European Union as well, Germany now being greenlit for adult-use cannabis, so when you look at that part, what, what kind of presence do you have right now in uh, Deutschland when it comes to cannabis at this point? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, we we represent a number of consulting firms that do business in uh, in Europe, uh, and they're working with people from setting up extraction outfits to putting in best policies and procedures and compliance standards in dispensaries. Uh, all the way down to genetic selection and, and cultivation techniques. Um, and then many of our finance clients have invested in certain of those operations. So so this is a is a is a big day going forward. Um, you know, I've always said whatever happens in Germany uh, will spread across the European Union. Germany tends to be a, a a fiscal leader. It tends to be a policy leader. And while this decision to uh, to move forward with Variations of cannabis legalization is uh, is is has been coming for a while. Um, it is sort of stepping out there, right? You know, the notion of medical marijuana has really been the the mantra of the day across Europe. You have research institutions, you have physicians, you have you know more mainstream therapeutic companies looking at cannabis versus just OTC flowers and buds and, and concentrates. So uh, so it's a controversial decision, but, uh, you know, ultimately it sets the pathway. You know, and just like the United States with, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves with the potential for rescheduling, whatever a major country like Germany or the U.S. policy-wise makes these decisions, other countries tend to follow. So you can never underestimate the importance or the significance of the impact out of these types of decisions, but it's a big step. Agreed. And yeah, if I get a chance, I would love to go and make some time to go and talk a little bit more about what's going on outside of the country. But let's go and talk about the United States in particular and another slight roadblock that might be to come in the state of New York. Politico recently reporting that a federal judge rejected an effort to halt New York's cannabis licensing process allowing the troubled rollout of the state's adult use market. Their ruling comes from a lawsuit brought by a pair of entrepreneurs who argued that New York's licensing rules unfairly discriminate against out-of-state residents in the violation of the U.S. Constitution. While New York's cannabis market doesn't have a residency requirement, licensed applicants can receive extra priority if they meet certain criteria, including having a past cannabis conviction in New York State, the plaintiffs in this case before Northern District uh, before the Northern District of New York Judge Ann Nardacci, who was a Biden appointee, 
argues that this creates an unfair advantage for New York residents. Of course, Politico can't help themselves to find a story that has to go and go, you know, bash on cannabis whenever they can find it. So, of course, they're going to do that part. But this case is significant. Is this something that you see that, you know, could cause a halt in the licensing process? Could this really be something serious enough to do that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not licensed in New York, and I don't know a whole lot about what's different about practicing law in New York. But I've got to tell you, I think there's there's so many odd things about what's happening there, right? Yeah. First and foremost, the fact that courts would step in and issue an injunction. In other words, let's stop everything because one small category or at least a category of 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 applicants might be, you know, might might and again, might be affected by this or might have not been given an opportunity. It just seems odd to me. Injunctions are something that courts do not just issue, uh, you know, on, on a regular basis. Injunctions are extraordinary relief. So for courts to keep finding reasons to delay the licensing, the issuance of licenses, the consideration of the applications in New York just boggles my mind. But then, you know, it leads back to this agency in New York seems to have bungled everything. And I don't know exactly even what that means. I've never been on the the side of working for a government agency on these things. So I don't know all of the day to day of what they have to do. But it just occurs to me that they they took expertise. I remember when the state was building out their cannabis licensing and, and regulatory division. They were hiring people from the industry. So when I heard that news, and I've got some friends that work there, that worked in the industry for many, many years, and I thought, wow, New York's really trying to do this the right way. They're trying to bring in people that aren't just bureaucrats or you know government enforcers, but they're bringing in people that understand the industry. This can only be a good thing. But my gosh, it, it seems like the exact opposite has happened. Every single thing that they've done has undergone scrutiny. Every single thing that they've done uh, seems to be questioned. Everything that they've done seems to just not be the right move. And again, maybe I don't know enough about uh, government law as it affects these types of decisions or New York law in, in particular, but it just seems really, really odd to me that they keep holding up the licensing process instead of just moving forward with the licensing process and fixing things later. But I guess that's what happens when you've got a legislature that says we're only going to issue, uh, you know, this many, uh, this many licenses. Uh, the market's saturated anyway. The market competes with the traditional or the gray market, if you will, uh, because, you know, there's not a bodega in New York that probably isn't selling some form of cannabis right. uh, and not licensed. I mean, it's a free for all there. I I remember being at a couple, what I call nothing less than a swap meet where you walk into a room and it's just open tables all over the place with pre-rolls and flour and I mean, giant bags of flour, et cetera, and not regulated in the marketplace, but still packaged properly and still, you know, sold at a premium and uh, it's an interesting, interesting environment, uh, and it makes me sad in a, in a certain way because I always thought that Los Angeles would be the model for how we sell cannabis, how stores exist. Well, Los Angeles proved that it wasn't that way, unfortunately, for political reasons mostly. So then I thought, well, New York's going to show us how to do this right. But this stuff keeps happening over and over and over again, and I think it's disappointing. It's disappointing for our clients that get licenses. We've got several in the pipeline and everything gets put on hold. It's disappointing that they just can't get it right when, you know, this, you don't have to reinvent this wheel. This has been done over and over and over again for about 15, 16 years now. So I just don't understand the problems, but it seems like the courts have a lot of power uh, and the parties that, that move forward have legitimate causes and it stopped everything in its tracks. Uh, but I'm still really, really hopeful. For that now, New York market. Part of it is, you said it right off the bat, a government agency is running this. It is government controlled. And for the federal courts to go and come in and feel like they need to intervene on what the state process is, 
there's no one in the story being asked about this by the Cannabis Control Board. Nothing. The licensing process they already have in place, I mean, there's only so many that's being allowed. There has been so much of prioritization on social equity. And even that alone has gone through the issues of there's such a rigorous and such a long strand, a stretched out process when it comes to who gets the licenses, the qualifications for them, going from a temporary opening, then be able to get inspection for a permanent opening up to two years, and then how much money is going to be coming off of that. The stories from NPR about, oh, it's 12 to 15 percent interest on the loans being offered to the banks that are making money off of this as well. And if you're not in the licensing system in New York, you got the lottery system in Illinois. And it's like, well, there might be people getting social equity licenses that might be qualified, but then if they ha- don't have the money for it, they're going to sell the license to somebody else at a premium to a company that doesn't have to qualify under social equity. There's a lot of things that you know, the you know the state government can also be at fault for, but they're also not defending those in court now having to go and defend themselves for the licensing process. So it's a fault of the state doing it and the part that they're not going to help and supporting those that they're putting through the program. Yeah, and you know, you you think that the legislature could have phased this in and considered different groups. You know, this this obligation, and it is an obligation, I would argue, uh, that we have as industry participants and if you're in a licensing role or a government role, that obligation is even more important to make sure that social equity is at least addressed. But I got to tell you, man, like it doesn't. I had hope for New York on their social equity program. It just seems like every time we try to um, sort of micromanage the process or try to uh, try to give people opportunities because of the history of the failed drug war and you know, the the adverse impact on people. It seems like every time we do that, it gets screwed up. And I just don't understand why it couldn't have been done in a more phased manner, considering that a lot of these things were going to happen. I mean, you know, courts in New York, I just don't always understand what's going on. I mean, you still have some of these, what I'll call legacy operators, operating without licensure with cannabis clubs. And they're not getting shut down. No. So I don't want anybody to get shut down. That's not my role. That's not my desire to see people's businesses get shut down. But come on already. If somebody's operating outside the licensed system, the government's got to exercise its resources at some point and, and exert some sort of enforcement control to at least give the other licensees a chance to compete in a regulated marketplace. And if the licensees here are social equity applicants, it's an even touch and go trickier system, right? Because, you know, social equity applicants uh, don't always have the entire set of skills or the entire background needed to run a multi-million dollar business, yet they qualify for a license. So sometimes I worry that those people are going to get taken advantage of by people that are just using them for their 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 skill set or their for or pardon me for their for their qualification standards. Uh, and you know, these are some of the things that I do think with a lot of the smart people involved with their agency that they could have gotten ahead of it, but they didn't get ahead of it. And here we are in this mess, which seems to to, to hold everything up. Uh, and those social equity applicants, the ones that were trying to help out, they're the ones that continue to suffer because, oh yeah, I've got a conditional approval or I've got a license, but I can't do anything with it. Still, it's like they keep getting punched in the gut and it's just sad. I talked to Christian Chavez. It's a social equity licensee who went through the CAURD program, the card, the card program, in New York, Stat of Cannabis. And I remember talking to him, and a couple weeks ago, we talked about how there's the issues with the licensing process itself. The Cannabis Social Equity Investment Fund, the way it's been used, and what kind of uh, interest rates are going to be putting, put, pushed back on, 13 to 14%. Chicago Atlantic is the private investment firm taking care of the loans for these companies. 1,500 stores, you just made point, uh, selling cannabis without a license, according to Mayor Eric Adams and the city sheriff, Anthony Miranda. And, you know, they might have taken some of the shops down, 48 shops, they said, in December, $4 million worth of product, and then $57 million worth of uh, cannabis from stores in the five boroughs since last spring. But that's in December. They're not even coming close to cracking down on 
the illegal part, but yet the courts at any time, they can't even go ahead and help defend those that are legally going through the process. I want to make this point as well, uh, Robert, because as you said, you don't practice in New York, but in other states, I'm sure you have to deal with this because there have been other various state cannabis programs, according to political here, that have challenged a federal court under the dormant commerce clause. This is funny. So whether it's barring states from interfering in interstate commerce, there is no interstate commerce. I don't even know how they go around this technicality, but there's no interstate commerce at all. So they're trying to say that, that the whether well, legal doctrine applies to state legal cannabis markets because that cannabis is still illegal under federal law. Okay, but this is again, they're they're trying to go ahead and, you know, retwist the the way it's set up. What can you tell me about this dormant commerce clause and how can they possibly think they can go ahead and use the excuse of interstate commerce when there is this, no, no such thing right now. Well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, unfortunately, one of the very first, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I'm a corporate lawyer, but I, I remember right. very deeply, and I've studied this a lot since then, uh, the idea of constitutional law. So interstate commerce has been interpreted under our constitution to mean literally anything, anything, even if it's small, that touches interstate commerce. So, for example, even if I'm not selling the cannabis across state lines for obvious reasons, I might order a solvent. I might order packaging. I might order something else that comes from another state. And therefore, that's all you need to say that this is involved in interstate commerce. Uh, and again, that's a little bit of an oversimplification of the issue. But uh, I, as a lawyer, I hate the jurisprudence that's around interstate commerce. Because what the, the the courts, when they started to interpret interstate commerce, they interpreted it as liberally as possible. And I don't mean liberally politically, I mean as broadly as possible, so that back in the day, during the FDR administration, which again, he was president, I believe, for four terms, right. that's when the government expanded dramatically. That's when they started to use interstate commerce powers to expand the government to create what they call the fourth branch of government, all these agencies, right? The, the rise of the bureaucratic state, that happened because of interstate commerce. These agencies were allowed to get involved because courts ultimately determined that anything, literally anything, no matter how small, can, is, is interstate commerce, and that state stands up to this day. But uh, th those are some of the things that, that we have to live with. Now, there is that case in Massachusetts, um, and that, that case in Massachusetts seeks to um, basically show that interstate commerce and the constitutionality or the constitutional rights of states are butting up against each other. In other words, states should be able to do what the states want to do, and the interstate commerce clause does not allow the federal government to interfere what the states are doing. And that's, of course, what the federal government does with its with its position of illegality and, you know, the DEA through its saber rattling and things like that. So so a lot of those things uh, have to be worked out. Uh, and I believe that this time around, that if this measure of those cases make their way to the U.S. Supreme Court, that we actually have conservative judges uh, that are textualists, meaning that it's more likely than not that these judges, Clarence Thomas is one of them, will rule in favor of the industry, not because they're in favor of the industry as a philosophical matter, but because of some of these prior broad interpretations. And these judges, these conservatives, want to rein it in and make it more narrow. Now, I haven't been able to find anything about that story in Massachusetts, but I did see Connecticut has another case where they're trying to go into the same thing, that they're trying to go and talk about that. It cannot apply, and that's the part where the bottom line is, okay, legal, by-the-books companies are getting penalized with this loophole of saying interstate commerce. As you have, you know, elaborately pointed out, goes back to the FDR administration. And so the legal outfits are practicing interstate commerce now anyway. So if you want to go get something from, from California or Colorado, I know that for years that once they were legalized, well, okay, now people are getting it across state lines. They don't care. They're not worrying about that either, but it's the same thing goes. And it's funny that they continue to do that. It's like, well, it's the same thing as always. 
where the court system is allowing these arguments to go into play on purpose, I think. I don't think they're really carrying one way or the other, but like if they're going to create another obstacle, they're more than happy to go and do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I'm not intimately familiar with the Connecticut case, but, you know, the, the Dormant Commerce Clause is also, uh, you know, an interesting pathway. A lot of people have talked about that. In other words, if, uh, if, if something's not expressly delegated to the federal government, mm-hmm. then the states reserve that power, right? So then how can the federal government interfere with state programs that want to create regulatory and licensure around commercial cannabis operations? That's, you know, oversimplified, but that's effectively the argument. And and it's a good argument. I mean, we are a, a foundation uh, of, 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 of a country based on states' rights. The federal government's supposed to be the tie that binds. It's not supposed to be sort of the 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 entity that tells everybody else what to do, except within very specific areas. And, you know, it seems like this is an area where the federal government uh, continues to overstep its bounds. And that's important because the one case, the most recent case that went to the Supreme Court that did not come in favor of the uh, the cannabis industry was a case called Gonzalez versus Raich, R-A-I-C-H. And um, in that case, they ruled in favor of continuing to uh, apply the federal prohibition against Mm -hmm. state-based licensees in large part because in that case, the court said, well, if we continue to allow California to do what it wants to do here, it's going to create opportunities for abuse and opportunities for diversion into the black market. Well, here we are years later, and the black market, so-called black market, is really, really small because most people are getting it through a lawful licensed dispensary or they're growing it themselves or getting it from a caregiver, all legal in the States. So the risk of, uh, of diversion outside of this state-regulated and state-licensed system is really, really small. And the even the FDA through HHS came out with their unredacted version of their uh, recommendation to the DEA a couple of weeks ago. And that document, 255 pages, goes on and on and on about how the risk of abuse around marijuana is almost nothing. And that people that use marijuana are not likely to suffer all of these terrible things that they told us decades and decades ago. So my well, let's go ahead, let's go and bring that up. We're going to go to commercial break, and I want to come right back into that. We're going to go ahead and talk exactly about the the descheduling and where it goes from that. So when we come back, stay tuned for that. I'm here with Robert Hoban, Chair of the Cannabis Practice at Clark Hill here on Blunt Business, back after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back. I'm here with Robert Hoban, Chair, Cannabis Practice at Clark Hill, and we were... Before the break, uh, Robert was actually just going right into the next subject, which is really wanted to get talking about the hundreds of pages of recently released documents provided by the Department of Health and Human Services, affirming what the overwhelming majority of the public has known for decades. Uh, I remember we're talking with Dr. Ben Kaplan with a CED clinic about this a few weeks ago, and now you know we, we from a medical standpoint we talked about the benefits towards that. And so, as you mentioned before, Robert, here's what they were saying that cannabis possesses therapeutic efficacy and its harms are not on par with those of heroin or even alcohol. And alerted that the EA has called on the agency to remove botanical cannabis from a Schedule One prohibitive, stat- prohibitive status in the Federal Controlled Substances Act and the Schedule to Schedule Three. Now, a question to you, Robert. Does this help enough to change the public perception of, of cannabis to prompt further financial relief or congressional movement to legalization? I, I think so. Um, a couple of things that are important about that report, and, I, and I'll tell you why I think so. Uh, number one, as you point out, they talked, they, in, in their analysis, they compared cannabis with the harms of alcohol. They didn't have to do that. No. Like it, this, that, 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 that analysis had nothing to do with alcohol, but it just goes to show you that this, the, 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 the activists, the folks that have pushed so hard to try to get some sort of change at the federal level and the, the sort of repeating 
that cannabis is safer than alcohol and science supports it, that that has had an impact on a federal government agency and its scientists who didn't need to comment on that. The second thing that's really, really important about those findings uh, by the FDA, by HHS, is that for the first time, they began to recognize some of the data that was out there. When I say data, I mean scientific data. I mean studies and just numbers, right? Previously, whenever the federal government was confronted with the question about whether marijuana, again, I'll use the word marijuana because that's what's in our Controlled Substances Act. Uh, marijuana, is it harmful? Well, there are no federal studies to say one way or the other. I mean, that's a bit of an overstatement, but if there were no federal studies, then the federal government didn't consider anything else. This 255-page analysis begins to recognize a lot of the data and the scientific findings that have come from the states. That's huge. They, they, haven't, they didn't go so far as to expressly recognize all of these international studies to the tune of thousands of studies. But the point is, they're recognizing things exist outside of the federal government itself. Those things are huge. Now, why does this send a signal? Because there are still a number of people that are not like us. We, we know this industry. We live and breathe this industry. We know what the science says. We know the what's right and what's wrong and what's real and what's not based on the stigma and, frankly, the lies that were laid as a foundation to schedule this substance the way it was scheduled many, many, many years ago. But a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people aren't involved in the industry. So when the, when the U.S. federal government comes out and in hundreds of pages recognizes that cannabis, marijuana, is not this terrible thing on society, actually helps far more than it hurts, is not really a risk for abuse or, you know, people are not going to get addicted to it per se. So the point is, that's a huge finding. So the two biggest things that are going to come out of rescheduling, number one, is 280E tax relief, right? If I make $100 and I can't deduct the $60 that it cost me to make the product that I'm selling, marketing, sales, everything beyond just the cost of goods sold, that I'm paying far more taxes than any business should have to pay to stay alive. So that will give those businesses tremendous cash flow, breathing room, and could impact their their bottom lines by anywhere from 11 to 30% based on the people I've talked to. So that's huge. Number two, the second huge thing is it changes the narrative and the stigma. The government doesn't have to say we lied to you before. They don't have to say we made mistakes before. They just have to say, you know what? What we know now, now, today in 2024, is that cannabis and the data, it's not that harmful to society like we once thought. And that has major repercussions for the rest of the world. So, yeah, I do think it changes the stigma. Now, descheduling is the ideal place to have this. Deschedule it, regulate it like alcohol or tobacco. In other words, through other health and safety measures that are not the FDA. But that's just not realistic unless there's political will. The agencies themselves are not going to deschedule this plan. So it has to be something that the R's and the D's or wherever the majority is at the time agrees to do. That's what they did with alcohol. That's why alcohol is not scheduled. It was removed legislatively from the schedule. So you've got to have political will for that. And I just don't see it right now. But I think this is a step in the right direction because it sends those messages, I said. And those messages are important, right? If I'm Germany, if I'm the United Nations, if I'm a small country in Europe, I care what the U.S.'s position is on the legalization of marijuana. I do. Whether we agree with that or not, it probably shouldn't be that way, but that's the way it is. So that's why it's so impactful. And Robert, I, I listen to a, a lot of programming enough in the cannabis industry to understand, listen, you, of course, we uh, in the, as an industry like to go and be arbiters of wishful thinking. You know, we're cautiously optimistic is always the word. And the thing is, I'm going to still be a realist about this, and I say this on this program all the time. All of you, I'm a broken record, but you know on this program I say the same thing over and over. Legalization, federally, uh, maybe three to five years. Because we need a supermajority on either, it's if it's Republican or Democrat or whatever it is, like-minded, 
has to be at least two-thirds one way or the other, House and Senate, for the bills that are already sitting there, waiting to be passed, waiting to be looked at, whether it's the the bill that Cory Booker had written or the one that was, you know, consolidation between uh, Ron Wyden, you know, Cory Booker and Chuck Schumer, the senators, the the Travers right there. Or it's the one that Elizabeth Warren and Cory Gardner put together, the States Act, or whatever you want. Kamala Harris writing your own bill. You have all those in place, but they can't get passed across uh, until there's that. But what there is that's been done, you know, these senators have tried to do things. Well, let's try to get this into the National Defense Authorization Act. Let's let's try to get the State Banking Act in there. Let's try to get into some other place. And I appreciate the maneuvers they've tried to make to try to get it in there, especially before the 2022 midterms. But let's talk about what they actually have done. And this is where I don't understand the Biden administration not taking credit or not amplifying this story further. And look, I'm not like being political, but I would just say, listen, if I were the Biden administration, you want to go ahead and show a win that you're doing right now in terms of getting your electorate to go ahead and have some motivation to go ahead and vote for you? You're the one trying to go ahead and push cannabis forward. But the problem is that they don't want to do it because the president doesn't necessarily approve. He's not even, the you know, I don't know if he would even sign the bill if it's brought to him. But what was done by his administration was smart. OK, so HHS, when you look at what they actually did, the Hill actually puts a great story and actually explains what they did with this descheduling process. It was tasked by the Biden administration in 2022 to review the federal designation and based on its conclusions, upon the real world experiences of over 30,000 health practitioners authorized to recommend marijuana under state law and more than six million registered patients in each state and the states that they serve. And that's where we talked about the conclusion. No safety concerns were identified in a review that would indicate the medical use of marijuana poses unacceptably high safety risks for the indications where there is some credible scientific evidence supporting its therapeutic use. Hey, you could take this right now to, you know, the Laura Ingrams of the world or the, you know, uh, the Jesse Water, all the Fox News people over there that want to go and constantly go ahead and be sanctimonious and say, well, OK, we don't like cannabis. We call it weed. We call it pot or the politicals of the world or wherever other outlets are are out there that want to go ahead and cater to the religious right, that's fine. I don't care about that. It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm just making the point. This is a win. And this is something where business owners, you know, people that are voters, they care about cannabis. This right here is a move in the right direction. It's going to get done before the end of the election season. By before November, we're going to have this allowed. So business owners... They're going to get the advantage of 280E, and there will be some further progress in research and other areas that will get a chance to go and see what else can be done. So the department official said that, well, the risks to the public health posed by marijuana are low compared to other drugs of abuse, such as benzodiazepines, a Schedule Four drug, or alcohol, which is unscheduled. So for my question for you, Robert, you know, aside from the 280E issues, businesses have encountered we've talked about that hell i've talked about it a lot on this program and i just had a guest on i recorded with this week to talk about that what is it from a business or citizen standpoint that could really be that that that's going to be significant for this i mean if you were you know advising you know what are the positives coming out of this besides the business portion well yeah i mean uh, there's there's the business portion but uh you know ultimately this is going to bring, so this is a double-edged sword. What I'm about to say, I'm going to make it sound like this is a positive thing, but many people in the industry don't think it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. When it's a Schedule Three substance, there are numerous large-scale companies, Fortune 500 companies, consumer packaged good companies, and the like, that are sitting on the sideline. They're not participating in cannabis. <laughs> And, you know, the purists in the industry, they'd say, well, we, we, don't, we don't want them participating in cannabis. They're just going to ruin it, right. keep them on the sideline. I understand that philosophy, and I, and I tend to agree with it in part. But if Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola are involved in the pipeline somehow in finished goods or production, manufacturing of Schedule Three marijuana products, that is a game changer. That sends a message not only to the world that this stuff is okay because the U.S. government says it okay, it's okay, but then these multinational companies are actually 
putting it into the marketplace. That is the shot in the arm, I hate to say it, that the industry needs in many ways. It needs those large companies. You need to be able to buy cannabis on, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but not far off, on Amazon. And you need to be able to have it delivered to you by an Uber. I mean, this is where mainstream needs to participate with what's happening in this industry, because only then will it have the voice that it deserves in Washington, D.C., when the politicians and the policymakers in D.C. are interfacing with the people that they already know that sell consumer goods, and those same companies want to sell cannabis, that's where you start to build the political will to deschedule the compound entirely, but not before then. Uh, but as you point out, this election is going to be a dogfight. It is going to come down to every single vote, and 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 my our Washington D.C. office here at Clark Hill is very influential in D.C. And you know we've got good word that this is all being you know driven at what is a pretty fast pace by the White House because well not because they they believe in the policy it seems but they'd like to have another policy success to your point so that people will vote for Joe Biden because every vote's going to count here if you look at the the poll numbers out there and and I, I don't take a side on the R's or the D's. I'm right. I think I think they're both bad, but the poll numbers are neck and neck, you know, and people are desperately fearful that Donald Trump's gonna win again. People are fearful that 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 Joe Biden's gonna win again. So everybody needs as many voters as they can. And this is a big issue. And 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 by the way, let's let's take a moment to note this. When uh Mitt Romney was running for president several years ago, there was a debate here at the uh University of Denver. And one of the representatives from what was then called the Cannabis, the Denver Post's Cannabis publication, they asked Mitt Romney about cannabis policy. And he kind of looked at him like, like, what are you, why are you asking me about cannabis? I'm running for president of the United States. Ask me about something that matters. They can't do that anymore. It's a mainstream issue. And to your point about rescheduling his progress, this is all progress. We just have to we have take the little victories, but keep pushing, and, and we'll get there. Uh, but Schedule 3 is interesting. And well, no, the thing is, too, why do I add a business owner on this says, you know, EC's 12% return of what's been put into taxes over year over year for companies, getting that back and being able to either reinvest or put it in their pockets. That's significant to me. The other thing, too, is that while it's the administration, I want to make the point, administration is actually allowing this to go on. And get the DEA to go and move forward, which, you know, attorneys are already saying most likely it's going to happen. It's going to be get done. But then the other part is, is that it's the person at the top. The president does not support cannabis, does not want to sign a bill on it. But yet his constituents, his the policymakers that are on his side are ready to go ahead. So there's a disconnect right there. Meanwhile, the disconnect is on the congressional side for Republicans that might be a little more, you know, th- trying to go ahead and, you know, placate to the religious uh, counter the voters that would like not to see cannabis because they still think there's these old stigmas still all stay in place. But meanwhile, President, former President Trump has said, you know, he would support a state, uh, the States Act, and went on record. Well, you know, he would look at it. He would definitely consider it. So he'd probably sign before Biden would. So there's the whole point of here where, you know, there's a, a lot of this division right here which has to get ironed out before we can see anything from the federal government aside from this. So this agency move is something that's going to happen. Safe banking, federal legalization. I don't see it right now at all. Yeah, I mean, th- this this th- this happens. Those things, I think, will follow closely behind it because those mainstream interests will support it. Now, here's an interesting thing, too, by the way, about Schedule 3. Schedule 3, I believe it's like it's Section 829 of the Controlled Substances Act. It says that to dispense a Schedule 3 substance, this is not a quote, this is me paraphrasing. Right, right. Dispense a, a Schedule 3 substance. Uh, it talks about Schedule 2, but it refers to downstream uh, scheduling. You just need an order, a prescription or an order from a practitioner. So the word order matters, and the word practitioner matters, because practitioner is not defined as a physician. So, arguably, the plain language of federal law, if marijuana is scheduled to Schedule 3, 
arguably these state-based systems that create licensing and standards and everything else that we know, um, that those those centers, those licensees, could qualify as practitioners under that definition and distribute Schedule Three medical cannabis. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's arguable whether that would apply interstate commerce as well, because it would be federally illegal under those standards. So, so there's a lot to unpack. Here is the point. So to sit back, throw your hands in the air, and go, "Oh, descheduling your bust. The rest of it's a bunch of crap." That doesn't get us anywhere. We have to recognize there are little victories, and nothing nothing moves in politics from point A to point Z. It has to go all like this, like this, like this. And this is one of those zigzags, but I think it's a pretty significant zigzag. And that's where I think we just need to stop and recognize that and say we still want to clamor for descheduling, but we have to show that these companies and this supply chain can function as a Schedule 3 business, and I, and I think it will. we got to go to another commercial break. When we come back, we're going to go ahead and move along and look at where things are going right now in terms of you know, growth of the cannabis industry within the United States. What states could be greenlit next to go adult use? We'll talk, go into details about that. And we'll talk about a series of articles you've written for Forbes about the hemp bill, the farm bill. We're going to talk about that coming up. After a short break, we're here again with Robert Hoban, Chair, Cannabis Practice at Clark Hill. And we'll be back with final questions after this. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back. I'm here once again with Robert Hoban, Chair of the Cannabis Practice at Clark Hill. By the way, website is clarkhill.com. Very simple. C-L-A-R-K-Hill.com. So when it comes to future states, coming on board that might be medical and be able to go ahead and make the transition in their state legislature legislative process to be able to go ahead and become adult use states. Let's talk about that. Now, in the whole context of things, we're, again, it's been about 30 years now since California legalized mer- mer- medical marijuana. 37 states have now followed suit, 24 states encompassing 53, 53% of the population, 53% have legalized adult use marijuana markets. And most of these statewide policy changes were enacted by voters at the ballot box. Maybe the federal government will follow suit. Again, we see all these examples. You know, it's not leading by example. Federal government can't do that. Just have to be overwhelmingly, you know, pressured to say, okay, we need to finally do something about this. So now two more states are coming into the chance to see this happen. A statewide ballot initiative in Florida, where I'm at, has been proposed once again by political groups Smart and Safe Florida. They're just trying to work on the, the terminology so that we can see an adult use be put up on the ballot as a, an amendment initiative for voters in November 2024. I will say that I voted in 2016 for it. Uh, it did not pass. And 2020 did not make it because there were some issues with the the literature, which is why the Florida Supreme Court did not allow it to go and go through. But right now, arguments are going through. The state Supreme Court has until April 1st to decide whether that measure will go onto the ballots in the general election. But it sounds like everything's got you know, all indications say that we're going to probably see it finally on the ballot once again. The Pennsylvania legislature in December passed a major expansion of the state's medical marijuana industry, and the governor is willing to pass any adult use expansion. Before I ask a question, Robert, i got to make this uh, programming note to our audience. When it comes to Pennsylvania, we have gotten the enormous opportunity to have a sitting state senator host a program here on Cannabis Radio, first of its kind, where he's going to be able to go ahead and speak about the process and speak to those in the process of getting Pennsylvania adult use. The show is called Planting Seeds with Senator Sharif Sharif Street. That show is now available at CannabisRadio.com, the Cannabis Radio app, and all major platforms where you listen to podcasts. I recommend you go ahead and check out the series. It's very comprehensive. And again, you're getting it right from the legis- legislators, the policymakers in the state of Pennsylvania looking to make it happen. So we really do appreciate Senator Street for participating in the program. It is a series now. You can listen to it. And I recommend you highly checking out that series to follow along. But back to you, Robert. What do you think about these states joining the list? Do you see this in 2025 where Florida and Pennsylvania become 25 and 26? 
I think so. I mean, the 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 numbers are there from the population. The consumers want it. Um, Florida is an interesting one for me, right? Uh, there's a bill being presented. Have I, if I read that correctly, in in recent weeks, where they're trying to limit the THC percentages of flour being sold in the dispensary system, right? Uh, and you know, these these kind of things are expected because the opposition doesn't go away. But uh, but at the same time, you know, you can't sell flour at one point. That was the big, you know, position in Florida. And then it, uh, now it's, you know, this notion that, you know, somehow, some way there should be THC caps. Uh, Florida is an interesting market to me. And it's per- it's particularly interesting because a lot of the people that live in Florida do come from the Northeast. And the Northeast has such a liberal attitude. And, and, and I don't mean liberal necessarily because they're Democrats. I think... Whether you're you're a Republican or Democrat, the Northeast tends to have a pretty liberal attitude towards cannabis, towards marijuana, regardless. I grew up in Jersey. That's my perspective. People people have always kind of known that marijuana is not this terrible thing that the government's always told us it is. And and, and there's there's a high percentage of use. So if those people make their way down to Florida, what happens down there? You kind of mix it with the Southern sentiment, which tends to be more conservative or just out of the box uh, against marijuana. I can't really sort that out, except that I can say, based on you know the demographics in the state of Florida, that ballot measure measure should move forward. Uh, there were prior ballot measures that didn't move forward. Uh, I think Pennsylvania shares a similar uh, you know d- demographic. I think Pennsylvania is another state where even if you're conservative in your politics you probably don't have a negative perception of cannabis or marijuana. Um, and, and and those are some interesting things because a lot of the Southern states, it seems that when you take a conservative individual, they also have very anti-cannabis uh, uh, positions as well. Whereas the conservatives in the Northeast tend to be more cannabis friendly. Uh, so I think that that bodes well for both Florida, for the reasons I described that for Pennsylvania. And I sure as heck, Hope Pennsylvania moves to the next level. Um, I mean, it's begging for it. You know, uh, you you have the southeastern part of the state. You have uh, the Pittsburgh area. I mean, there's major metropolitan areas across the state of Pennsylvania where people, uh, based on percentages, would support the outright adult use legalization of the plant. And that's ultimately what I believe we'll see. Now I'm going to transition over to what's been going on. There's a five-part series you had over in Forbes and I would have gotten through the whole thing if not for the paywall, but of course, what do you expect? Uh, but there was a, a, you recently concluded a five-part series in Forbes and, you know, you made a point about the farm bill. And I want to just take a clip from all this, that the entire cannabis industry has received a great gift, you said, by virtue of the hemp provisions in the farm bill that have entirely removed all derivatives and downstream compounds derived from a cannabis plant containing less than 0.3% Delta-9 THC from the Controlled Substances Act. This represents the federal recognition and legalization of all such derivatives and compounds, cannabinoids, etc. Such compounds are mere ingredients of the big scheme from a supply chain perspective. And you also reported that Congress is discussing raising the Delta-9 THC limit from 0.3% to 1%, which will only place more downstream cannabinoids cannabinoids in the supply chain and corresponding marketplace. So that's some great possibilities to come. Talk to me about those. Yeah, you know, I, I wrote the five-part series because I, I heard too many people just talking negatively about the hemp sector of the cannabis industry. And um, the hemp sector has been about as innovative as you possibly can be. I mean, at the beginning, the innovation was centered around CBD and we saw a lot of these other minor or rare cannabinoids. We saw pre-rolls make it into the marketplace. Those pre-rolls became THCA flower. Um, they kept pushing that they had Delta 8, Delta 10, and just outright Delta 9. Um, I've got news for people. Those compounds, all of them, are federally legal. And if the compounds are legal... Just because it doesn't come from the quote unquote marijuana plant does not mean that the farm bill is not a huge victory in and of itself. Right. If I'm going to make a concentrate, or if I'm going to make a medicine, or if I'm going to put THC into a beverage, why wouldn't I use 
the hemp plant to do that if it's federally legal. That gives my company cover. It doesn't put any 280E tax burden on me and the like. And then you've got the marijuana sector who's worked so hard and has been over-regulated and overtaxed and had to work so stringently to try to get to the point where they're viable and they're accepted in their communities and the like and go through the expensive licensing. But that doesn't mean that you need to take the other side of the industry down. Those The hemp derivatives tend to operate largely in terms of consumer demand in more conservative states or red states. I call it red state weed. Um, ultimately, I don't believe those things are going anywhere. Those states have these jobs. They have the uh, infrastructure. They have hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars based on wiki economic studies to show that people want those products. We're seeing those products in terms of beverages at two and four milligram Delta 9 THC from hemp being sold in mainstream liquor stores, mainstream sports events, mainstream festivals and music events. I mean, I think the cat's out of the bag or the toothpaste is out of the tube. I don't think you can put it back in there. So I beg everyone to understand the issue and understand that unless I'm buying a flower that has above 0.3% Delta 9, or unless I'm buying a wax or a concentrate that is super, super potent, those things are going to be serviced by federally legal hemp. They're already being serviced by federally legal hemp, and there's nothing wrong with that. So why not just take a victory and work together to establish your brand in red states, purple states, and in blue states, not just blue and purple states, expand across the country, sell products that are derivatives from the hemp plant. I mean, we actually had a federal court weigh in and say, yes, even Delta 8, which is, is subject to uh, you know a chemical process downstream from being extracted from the plant as CBD and, and converted to a, an isolate, even Delta 8 is a legal compound based on the court's review so far. So I don't know why people don't take that as a victory just because it's a victory that comes in a package that they didn't expect or didn't want. I mean, if you want marijuana legalization because of everything that, you know, criminal justice and social justice and and just freeing the plant, that's great. I think we'll get there. But 50% of that already happened with the farm bill. All I'm saying is open your eyes and recognize that. And from a business perspective, it's far easier to raise money when you don't have 280E and you're selling something federally legal, I don't expect the federal government to turn that around because it's been politicized now. You've got red states and blue states selling different products, and there's just not as much stigma when it comes from a hemp plant as this does, it is from the marijuana plant. So, so I think we just need to open our eyes, and whether we like it or not, it doesn't mean we have to choose Delta 8 compounds over a, a, a traditional marijuana flower or marijuana distillate. But consumers should be given that choice. I firmly believe that. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at all of this progress and all of these things that are happening, look at Ubers and Lyfts. Uber presented itself as a lesser regulated way to have taxi service. What happened when it came out? The taxi said, no, 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 no. We got to get rid of Ubers. Ubers still exist, guys. Hotels, when they were presented with Airbnbs and VRBOs. No, 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 we need to regulate that. We can't have that competition. Airbnb still exists, guys. My point being, things evolve. Taxis were not going to be the only way we can get from point A to point B for all of time. Uber's filled that void. Just like marijuana is not the only answer to liberalization at the federal level for, for cannabis reform. It's already happened through AMP. Just recognize it. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to buy the products, but recognize it and stop trying to take it down because those those companies, they pushed really hard. They've spent a lot of money to get states to actually regulate them. They want to be regulated. They want to sell products that are safe in the marketplace, and they do because they push for it. So just open your eyes and recognize that Ubers and taxis exist at the same time all over the world. 
I'll leave you on the soapbox right there to go and continue to talk about that, Robert. Thanks so much for being on with us. Again, Chair Cannabis Practice at Clark Hill. And for those that would be interested in be able to go ahead and working with you, depending on what state they might you might represent, if you can go ahead and just talk to people real quickly, the website is clarkhill.com. Uh, just talk to those that would be interested to go and work with you and your team if they are looking for uh, representation. One hundred percent. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. Always a, a pleasure and an honor to sit down with you and talk about things. I'm a big fan. I, I know most of us here at Clark Hill uh, tune in on a regular basis. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, you can find us at ClarkHill.com. You can find me at Bob at BobOben.com. Check out BobOben.com uh, for anything uh, beyond the law. And uh, I hope that uh, people enjoyed this take uh, and uh, look forward to joining you again sometime in the future. Hopefully when we've got some some big news to report. Oh, let's well, wait for it. When there is anything else that comes across, please let us know about it. And, you know, we'll be waiting for the next time we could have you come on and make the road go around. And obviously, next time we talk, let's see if we see the HHS rescheduling get done. And, you know, we get some other great news in cannabis. We'll go ahead and hope for that. Thanks again, Robert. Thank you. And thank you, listeners. We'll talk again. See you next time. <laughs>